he's actually one of the few people who has the Triple Crown, I believe. He's got a Grand Prix Championship. Mm -hmm. He's got a U.S. National Championship Correct. and a Pro Tour Championship. Yes. Uh, I think Luis is one of the people who has that. It, it's a very elite crowd. It's, yeah, it's a very, very small crowd. And we're going to start with Gindy here on the left. He's going to start out with Plains Island an angelic, angelic wall. wall. So we do see white blue here. We'll see if it's going to be an aggressive or a defensive take on white blue. As Goldstein just has multiple swamps and is passing the turn. Yeah, so it looks like, you know, with the angelic wall and there's an Oromancer in Gindy's hand that's just coming down to the 2 2 for 2. Looks like Gindy's kind of a controlly blue deck that just has the white cards to accentuate his uh, his other spells. Yeah, even just playing a boring Oromancer and so, not, not even like saving it to get something yeah. back, that might be a little bit telling that maybe he doesn't have a lot of things to get back or if he just wants to be aggressive. Not this game, he might not have anything. It looks like Charles just bashing in with this Oromancer. He's playing a Chasing Griffin, or Charging Griffin, that one. 3-3, uh, three, three, you know, your Phantom Monster, 3-3 three, three Flyer for 4. Okay. Don't really want to block with it. Looks like Gendy's just mono black. Uh, four Swamps. Does he have a four drop to play? He's got a, couple, he's got a couple more swamps, and as you see him consulting his teammate up top there, Nate yep. Strum. He also has a dark favor in his hand, too, but nothing, not a ton to do right now. We'll see how Black Goldstein's deck is, if he has corrupts or anything. And he has 16. Six, he's a 16 swamp, so, one Mutavolt deck. Okay, so we'll talk a bit more about this later, but we may have the same thing on the other team, too. Oh, swamp based deck? Yep. Oh, okay. This, this is an interesting split in this format. We were talking about, uh, so Quag Sickness takes down the Charging Griffin. Uh, you know, we're talking about you know this two-two split of color between all your decks. If you just go two-two mono color, that's another thing. And you know, black might have the capability of doing that in this format. So Oromancer crashes in. It looks like Sarah Angel's gonna hit the board for Charles. Another nice play there from yeah. Gendy. Just he's got he's got some solid cards in his deck, as you yeah. can definitely tell. Looks like his last few cards are another Oromancer, and I think that's a Wall of Swords. Oh, well, well it's gone now. We're gonna Mind find out right takes now. it down, yep. but six power on the board puts Danny down to ten life. Charles passes the turn. Danny draws. He's going to corrupt this angel, I think. Yeah, there is a corrupt in his hand. He actually has two of them in his deck. And part of the reason that he's mono black, Ari, is he has two copies of corrupt, he has two quag sicknesses, and he has two nightmares. Jeez. Yeah, nightmare is a classic. I'm, I'm sad they got rid of the Melissa Benson art. I'm, <laughs> I'm sad. The old flaming horse. And there is the first nightmare. That is a 6-6 six, six right now flyer. You see, Gindy has drawn an island. I think his other his card is an angelic wall. Yeah, I don't think those are going to be staying in for long in this matchup. No, I can't imagine that they are, but I, I, I can't imagine Gindy's going to get in the red zone right now either. There's not the, the thing that we talked about in this format is there's really a lack of combat tricks, so there's not yeah. anything that he can really bluff. He, he could have show of valor. Yeah, that that's could be that pretty be much bluff, it. But I think that. Uh, Especially when you haven't played the game in a way that you've represented it at all. I don't think you can make that attack necessarily right here with the Sarah Angel. Especially when, if your opponent attacks with Nightmare, he's not really in a race that he's going to try and win. So, Gindy's getting bashed with this 7-7 seven, seven Nightmare now. Uh, so, probably just going to throw away this wall. Yeah, I mean, I think that's what that, that's why you kind of see the pause here. Is, is, is am I going to block with the wall now, or am I going to try to block with the wall later? It looks like he's just going to... He has to like, how many cards he has in his hand. I think that... At seven power, at six power, you probably don't want to block because that's still four hits to lethal. Okay. But I think seven is the point. It's going to be three hits to lethal. Uh, I think you probably want to chump. I think that, uh, like, you know, this is this is as big as this nightmare is going to get. It's not like this wall is going to chump something bigger. But I guess Gindy's going to just accept the walls he's, hanging out. He's going to take the first blow. Okay. Going to thirteen. Sarah Angel cracks in. Oh, snap pump. block and a pump. Okay. Single pump. Yeah, Shade I, dies. So I, I think Goldstein thinking that, maybe it got plus two, plus two on yeah, the pump. Yeah. yeah. That, uh, that card's actually really important. I think that's one of the... Black doesn't have anything bigger than 2-2, two -two, but that's, you know, the best common flying finisher, I think. So a misstep there from Goldstein. He's but, still quite far ahead. Yeah, I mean, he still uh, has... Gindy's still looking at these double angelic walls as kind of bricks at this point of the game. Goldstein shoves in with the eight power nightmare. Six fires off a corrupt, takes down the Sarah Angel, goes back up to eighteen. Yeah, now he's just now 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 his life total is just so healthy. He's gonna follow up with a corpse hauler and just pass the turn back. Yep. So if anything goes wrong with the nightmare, if it were to die, claustrophobia. Well, not to claustrophobia. Yeah. yeah. So this is the problem that you talked about with uh, 
with some of the removal in this set that yeah. actually that actually doesn't kill the creature, it leaves right. the creature in play. So uh, looking at his graveyard, there is a shade for him to get back. He can, you know, that shade that we may have accidentally thrown away and misread the ability. Yeah. It's okay. We'll come back, and the shade might just be enough to take down the game, especially at this point. Oh, but we're opting to dark favor up this guy. This guy turned into a five two. Five two. Uh, I actually, I'm okay with this line. I don't think dark favor on the shade really does much, and this crack in gets in damage or puts it over the wall, and then we can, you know, dark favor just did three damage there. That's fine. I can, I can live with that. It's just get back the shade. Gindy drew divination, so see what else he re revise into. Two land. Yeah, so he's looking at island, island planes right now. So divination gets him through the land glut, but doesn't help him right now. Yep. So Oromancer hangs back. I would have EOT sacked this card smaller, I think. I think I want that shade in play. That's the absolute best card I could have. It's also possible that Danny is looking at his deck and seeing, you know, I have a Vampire Warlord and a Blood Baron. I can just hang out with this corpse hauler and play until I draw a sack outlet and get back Nightmare. Another land for Gindy. So both players not really doing much. Gindy's got the wall and the Oromancer and lands. Danny's got the corpse hauler with the Dark Favor, so the 5-2 Raise Dead and a Claustrophobia Nightmare in play. Yeah, I, I think I'm kind of with you in that, you know, I I, I kind of want to get the shade back. Like, I, I, I understand the reason that Golson's not doing that is because he doesn't want to throw away his Dark Favor, but I want to get the shade back because I just want to get this game yeah. over with. I, I was absolutely fine with just throwing the Dark Favor into three damage, getting the shade back, because we're approaching the point where, like, that damage there makes the shade lethal in one or two very quickly. Yeah. Instead of, I, th I didn't do the math exactly. He's got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yeah, that puts the shade from lethal in three swings to lethal in two swings, getting him, you know, one additional damage on that. That's, uh, well, I guess we drew the Warlord, so we uh, we got rewarded for holding off. Yeah, so now he can make the play that you mentioned, which is sacrifice the Nightmare yep. to get rid of the Claustrophobia, and then sacrifice the Corpse Hauler to get back the Nightmare. So, yes. so it's this convoluted little circle that we're going to go around to be able to get that yes. back, but I'm not going to make that play yet is Goldstein, as Gindy does play a Messenger Drake past the turn back. I think Alter's Reap is the draw step here, I believe. Yeah, Might Alter's be another Reap is the draw step, that's awesome. Yeah, okay. well, Alter's Reap would be exactly what he's looking for. It's uh, it's going to be a corpse yeah, Alter's Reap is in the side yeah. not the main deck here. Um, yeah. So in comes the Vampire Warlord attacking for four, basically saying you can block whatever you want to because I can save my guy, and I'm more than happy to save my guy by sacrificing a Nightmare. Yes, especially when I have a raised dead on the board. Yeah. Gindy's debating whether he wants to throw the Oromancer in front or the wall. Yep. I, I think you want to throw the Oromancer, because if you throw the wall, it can't chump block the Nightmare later. Yeah, I think the wall actually has some, some value, you know, like yeah. three or four turns the, down the road. And though the thing is the Oromancer might be able to get in starting now, or soon. You know, if the Nightmare comes back and starts attacking, we've got a bunch of X shoots on T, so. Let's see. Um, I I'm looking at this deck list here. I'm not, you know, Dark Favor is a huge fan of it in this deck. Yeah, you know, I, I don't think that his deck is really that aggressive of one. Yeah. You know, it can make it so his guy's a little better, maybe trade up, but I think he's playing so, a more defensive role. Yeah. So we've got the, the Corpse Hauler gets back the Nightmare. The Nightmare was sacked to regen the, the Warlord. Uh, Gindy draws a Sensory Deprivation, but that Nightmare is big. <laughs> that, that Nightmare is bigger than minus three. So Claustrophobia is now in the graveyard. If Gindy has another Oromancer, he can get it back, but he used his first two in uh, the early game. Yeah. And you I, see the Sensory Deprivation is actually pretty good against the Vampire Warlord, making it into a 1-2. Um, but I, And I think I think Gindy is probably going to pull the trigger. Yeah, I, I don't think you can afford to save it. It's, not, it's never going to be enough to take down this Nightmare. Yeah. Nightmare's a 9-power creature now. Danny's got another land in his hand. It's going to be 10. Yeah, no, gonna, this gonna this nightmare is just going to kill you in one hit. It's it's okay. Don't worry about it. All right, so Goldstein draws a card. Looks like a Xanthra Necromancer. Another nice card from his deck. His deck looks very, very strong. Yeah. I You know, he has a lot of options on, like, which kind of 23rd card he has that I don't necessarily agree with, but it's, it's all, like, format-specific decisions. Like, I like duress in this format a lot. Yeah. He, he appears to be leaving them in the sideboard, maybe waiting for the opponent to represent having the removal spells or things that he wants to dress. Uh, you know, he, he has he has 23 playable black cards, and that's that's his game plan: is corrupts and nightmares. And so there is the necromancer. After Gindy does chump block here, 
with the angelic wall. He's going to play the corpse. He's going to get that back, sacrifice, and just play the other one. Okay. He's corpse hauling corpse haulers to make tokens. Theme deck. Cute. I'm actually kind of jealous. That's fun. That's pretty actually, sick. I actually kind of like that. I like that, that a lot. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, Corpse Hauler is a human, triggers Xanthar Necromancer, yeah. and makes a zombie. Yeah. So actually, actually, I actually like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Looping those. He's I'm, going through. That's, that's really awesome. He's going through the back door we, to make some you know, tutus. For a format that I thought was really straightforward and like just good cards are good, average cards are average, you see it all on the table, we're, we're seeing some pretty awesome things going on just the first two rounds. You know, wishing for more wishes, uh, chaining together a bunch of zombie tokens. No, they, I'm pretty impressed. Pretty impressed. I don't think uh, I don't think Gindy's in love. Yeah, yeah, I think Gindy's, Gindy's doing the little finger Gindy's, yeah, Gindy's explaining to, to I think Chris Van Meter. He's like, yeah, so he can do this for as long as he wants, and I can't even break it up because they're grave diggers, and he can just keep doing it. Yeah. Oh, planner cleansing. Well, I hope you're tapped out with the one in play. We needed it this turn right now. So we've got uh, we got the the mythic sphinx here. It's a three seven, and whenever a creature with flying Attacks, you draw a card, I believe? That's correct. Whenever a creature you control. You control with flying. Yeah. Oh, whenever a creature with flying. Never with mind. Fly, so it yeah, can okay. be his. Okay. So, so it is uh, symmetrical. Well, loosely I, I symmetrical. Use I use symmetrical loosely there, yes. Yeah, you know, this card's pretty, you know, I, I'm not going to complain about playing it in this format. It's a pretty acceptable mythic rare to kill people with. Yeah. It's not absolutely game shattering. I don't think you can give blue two absolutely game shattering mythics. You know, we already have Jace, so. This card is very fair. It's very, it's, it's fairly going to defeat your opponent. Yeah. So Gindy draws a card off the Nightmare Attack, draws another card off the Chump with the Messenger Drake. Uh, this Sphinx is interestingly, you know, I, I think that the Zombie Engine might actually be important. I thought the Nightmare would just take it home, but uh, yeah, yeah, I, the, this, I, I'm, this Sphinx might have been enough to stabilize against the Nightmare. But we're just paying five mana to make a Zombie with this Corpse Hauler for the rest of the game, and I think that. You know, the fact that Gindy has to answer that in addition to whatever else he's doing is uh, going to make things real troublesome. So, Gindy's drawing a card. Does he have a planter cleansing in his deck to draw to? Let's see. Do you want to spoil it for them, or do we want to leave it as a surprise? I, want to, I kind of want to leave it as a surprise. Okay. Well, I know, and I won't tell you guys. All right, fine. Yeah, turn the deck list over. I don't want to be able to see. Okay. Gindy going to so, play a Griffin Sentinel and a Wall of Frost, and he has enough mana up available to play the Sea, the sea Skite in his hand as well. So he's trying to make a comeback here, and he's going to be able to draw a bunch of cards to be able to do so. If you're Goldstein, you want to get this over with. It's a Mark of the Vampire he drew. What are we going to suit up here? That's a card I'm absolutely okay with uh, being in his deck. You know, I said stuff about Dark Favor earlier. Mark is, Mark is just good times. Yeah, Mark is just good. Mark of a Nightmare? Shove. Yeah. So Mark goes on the Warlord. Make just he wants to build bigger threats. He wants to spread his power, not put it in one place, especially against this deck that could pacify or whatever to his creature. Yep. He's not getting in with the nightmare. He doesn't want Gindy drawing to a potential planter cleansing. He's just shoving with all the ground guys. So do, you like, do you like the no attack with nightmare? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, you know, I like the no attack with nightmare for a lot of reasons. I think that it prevents Gindy from attacking back with his flyers and drawing cards. You know, like the way you're going to lose this game is that Gindy gets to draw a bunch of cards and finds a planner cleansing or some other ridiculous out or like a Jace or whatever and you know you have the game locked up in another angle why let Gindy draw to his outs even if he doesn't have them um, we see the blocks here damage is gonna after the dust has settled excuse me you're gonna see uh, the necromancer go to the graveyard the zombie be put into play for that so we've got does Goldstein a very stacked board. He does tap out very, very low here, so planner cleansing right now would actually be very, very good. Well, he'd still have two zombies in play. <laughs> How so? Necromancer triggers. Dead. Oh, it died? Triggered. Yeah. Oh, wow. Exactly those, sir. That might have been a little aggressive. That might have been one of the cards I want to hold back. Gindy can draw three cards on this attack. He wants to uh, shove in and see what happens. So here's some mana, here's a messenger drake, and he's gonna pass the turn back. Ari, I don't think he has a planner cleansing. This is not representing a planner cleansing. I don't, I don't think he has a planner cleansing, no. I think if he had a planner cleansing, he would have tried to Hail Mary attack. Absolutely. See if he's he a, gets there. We're counting up the creatures. Goldstream draws a card for the turn. He does have a swamp, he's gonna play it. 
Last card in his hand is a bit of a mystery. He's going to turn him all sideways, and Gindy is going to concede. So Danny Goldstein is going to win game number one here over Charles Gindy. You see another another match in this matchup. Chris Van Meter did win game number one over John Chase. We're going to yeah. cut to another match for you guys in just a moment. But am I right? Is there no planner cleansing? Tell the truth. Tell the truth. No planner cleansing. Right. I didn't think so. That, that play kind of gave away the, uh, the surprise. I think we would have seen the old Hail Mary if he did have Absolutely. one. Absolutely. Goldstein's deck is... Super powerful. Yeah, it's uh, it's pretty awesome. And the awesome thing is that Chris Van Meter has the same deck. You know, yeah. he's only got one Nightmare and one Corrupt, but uh, 17 Swamps, multiple Quag Sickness, Sangir Vampire, Shadowborn Demon. You know, that those those make up for the lack of Corrupts. I was gonna say, so gold, he's basically Goldstein Light is his deck. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's we got some uh, mono black battles going on over here. Mono black is like. I, I don't, know, beams on I don't know like what the best deck is, you know, in this format, but Mono Black is kind of a deck that I think kind of is, is a deck that people really want to draft. I don't want to say it builds itself, maybe it builds itself in Team Steel, but you know, if you can get a Team Steel deck, you would like to have that one. Yeah. Um, I think that Mono Black's a little unrealistic uh, to, to lean on as an archetype, necessarily. But I, mean, I think it's really hard to draft. Yeah, but I mean, it's obviously good. Uh, it, like we said, the black cards do exactly what you need them to, but the black rares and uncommons are pretty good. So it looks like that game just finished. Yeah, we cut over to Kenny Caster facing down a lethal Pitchburn Devils that he can't actually kill because it's a three life. And so Nate Strum was ahead. Caster drew his card for the turn, which was a Chandra's Outrage, which just did not help him. And he's going to concede that game. So it looks like Nate Strum has won the game and potentially the match so yeah. far. And if that was the match, it was a it was quite a quick one there. So yeah, we'll they, see. Looks like Nick Strom, let's let's take a look at his deck. I, it looked like a pretty aggressive blue red deck. That, that's one of the archetypes I actually kind of, you know, looking at the cards like a lot. I think that um, you know we said blue was the best color, right? So the red cards are red cards are nice too. I mean, it dep it really, the question is like what what color does it pair up best with? But we'll get the Strom's deck list in just a moment as we see John Chase versus Chris Van Meter, Deadly Recluse on Chase's side to go along with. Some forest and some plains, and Van Meter over there with a the Child of Night. Interestingly, he opts to not trade for this Deadly Recluse. I would have liked trading there. I like just getting Deadly Recluse off the table before it trades for something bigger than a 2 1. But uh, CVM's just hanging back. Maybe he's just going to kill it at some point. Uh, Sarah Angel in play for John. It looks like are those mountains in his hand. He boarded in some mountains. We got some active treasons potentially out of the sideboard. Mountains, huh? I did not expect mountains. He he probably boarded in Act Reasons. All right. Maybe a little Owen Turtenwald school of thought that we saw a little bit earlier, because you do see a mountain in Van Meter's hand. His deck list, again, does start with just 17 swamps and all black cards, so it could be Act Reason that we do see. So Nightwing Shade comes down and contests the Sarah Angel. Uh, again, that's really important. Black is, if I remember correctly, it's the only color with a common flyer that contests the uncommons. You know, Deadly Recluse kind of does, but... Nightwing Shade holds its own in that fight. Actually, next turn, this Nightwing Shade is going to be bigger than that Sarah Angel with three pumps. So, another mm. deadly recluse from there from Chase. So that Sarah Angel attack brings life totals down a little bit, 18 all, I believe. But uh, these deadly recluses are going to hold the fort for a while. Uh, you know. Like I said, I like the attack earlier. You know, just. Child of Night trading for Deadly Recluse is absolutely okay because that Deadly Recluse no longer gets to trade for my Nightmare or for my night, uh, my Shade. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and as we see here, now CBM's looking at a board where what, what are his attacks? We're gonna, you know, can't attack these two power guys with the Sarah Angel, can't attack in with the Shade and just trade it because, you know, we gotta, we're gonna have to run him out of Deadly Recluse the hard way. Yeah, things look like they may have gotten a little more difficult. You see CBM pointing at a card in his hand, figuring out what he wants to do. This is... A Nightmare. That was a nightmare. All right, 5-5. So, five. Five. so, Sarah Angel now outclassed in the air. We've got an old-fashioned board stall. Yeah, I mean, outclassed in the air right now. You know, let's say that, you know, Chase draws his card and just immediately attacks CVM. Is CVM going to block with his nightmare? Yeah, because even if he trades the nightmare away for the trick, he's got the corpse hauler, he's got the shade. You know, this nightmare trading away is not the end of his flying defense. Okay. <laughs> so you would trade? I would absolutely trade here. Let's see if Van Meter does the same. Or uh, you would block. I don't know if I it's going to be a trade. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I would absolutely block here. 
So it looks like Sarah Angel has been, yeah, it's coming across. You guys see it pushed up a little bit there. Deadly Recluse hanging back on defense. And Van Meter doing one of the things that He's, you can do in Team Sealed now, which is consulting his yeah, teammate. Double block is a, is a pretty interesting play. Um, I'm actually, I'm not sure how huge of a fan I am of double block. Double block beats Giant Growth. It beats Briar Pack Alpha. Loses the show of Valor. Loses the show of Valor, right. Um, and if there's any deck that's going to be heavy on show of Valors, I think it's the deck with the deadly recluses. Okay. Make them bigger. Yeah, your pump spell is going to make it live through everything. You know, Giant Growth makes it a five. There are some fives that it will trade with. You know, but show of Valor, no, nothing is showing six. Bruce, so, Rose, I feel like you want to block here, though. Once again, saying. There was no block. They consulted. Van Meter talked to Gindy and Caster about blocking, potentially double blocking. And they decided no blocks necessary. Going to go down to 14. And Chase is going to tap some mana, play a card post combat, and pass the turn. I believe that's a spore mound yeah. in, the, in the sapling token from yep, the there landfall. It is. The not actual landfall, yeah, landfall. Yeah, landfall that is not landfall. So, one of the reasons you might not want to block there is that CBN has a ring flush in his hand. So, he thinks if you just can untap, there's never going to be a turn again where the trick matters. So, I, that's like a very reasonable thing. I didn't necessarily see the, the like process of the ring flush when I first saw it. So, you know, if you are if you have a way to beat a trick later, you know, taking, you're at 18, that's fine. You're also playing against a deck that has no reach in green-white. Yeah, there's enlarge and that's about it. And there is no, uh, there is no overrun. Yep. Either to really punish you. As here's Quag Sickness attempting to Sarah kill the Sarah Angel. Angel. I, I don't agree with that necessarily. I think that, uh, I think that CBM, I think that CBM is underestimating how much these deadly recluses are messing up his game plan, especially with a Mark of the Vampire in his hand. He's got answer. Well, he, he, I, I definitely agree with you that like the deadly recluses are like they're a problem in the fact that you have to get through them to actually be able to win the game. He has an I, answer for one with Ring Flash. He's going to have to find an answer for a second one. My, my issue is that, you know, he didn't attack on the early turns to trade. Okay. Um, he didn't... I think that the Sarah Angel and him getting attacked is pretty irrelevant. I think he has a sort of board dominance with these large flyers. And I don't think Chase can mount a, a reasonable offense against this board. And I think that he just wants to... If he gets the deadly recluse out of the way, he can start closing before Chase finds the answers to the flyers. Um, but it looks like he's sort of he's he's realized you know, what he's got to do. He's got to you know blast through these deadly recluses. He's gonna throw the shade away at one first. You know we still have ring flesh. We still have a rebuy on the corpse hauler. We're gonna have to grind him down, but we have the resources to do so. Yeah, he just needs to, as you said, just grind through these deadly recluses. Deadly recluses, because they're basically you know walking removal spells. Yes. You know that's what they currently stand as, kind of annoying walls that can trade for things. But he does have the resources currently to grind through those. The question is, what does Chase have to kind of get himself back into this game? Yeah. Um. Let's see here. Yeah, that spore mound throws a bit of a wrench into the plans of maybe trying to get attacks in that are this child of night trading for one. But, you know, child of night only goes so far, Yeah, I feel like. So Chase is just opting to take the damage, take the four on the double pump of the shade, going down to 14 himself. Shields are down here for Van Meter, so let's see if Chase can do anything to take advantage right now. Yeah, no ring flesh up. Well, it looks like, I, I believe... I want to get a stack list in front of me because I believe there's a Briar Pack Alpha in his hand. There's also the Green Rare Sliver, the 6-6, six, six, and the, a Giant Spider. Okay. Or the th plus 3 plus 3, 3-3 three, three Sliver. The Megantic. The pre-release card. Big Papa Slivs. That's his, uh, that's his, that's his nickname? Yeah. That, <laughs> Big, that's, Big Papa Slivs? That's what they call him. On the streets. Well, he, I mean, he does have some very, very good cards to draw, so he does have Briarpack Alpha in his deck, Dust Chase. In his hand, yeah. Yeah, he has it yeah. in his hand as well. He has mm -hmm. Garrett Collar of Beasts. Uh, he does have two copies of Giant Spider, one of them currently in his hand. He also has three copies of Pump the Week as yeah, well. Yeah, that's pretty sweet in this Deadly Recluse yeah. deck. You know, Bones... You know, again, this is a format where the good cards are very, very good. I'm okay with playing a Bone Shards if it's accomplishing killing whatever their Shivan Dragon is or something like that. Six mana, there is your Megantic Sliver. He's 6-6. Six, six. Other Slivers are going to get plus 3, plus 3. That he controls. Yes. No longer symmetrical. Yeah. No fear of CVM dropping a uh, Siphon Sliver as a 5-5. Five, five. Yeah. Spore Mound. Spore Mound to me, because there's no overrun in this format, super underwhelming card. 
The one ones that it makes, are those ever really going to be all that relevant? It's, it's a small amount. Of, it's enough value that being a 3-3 for... Uh, a 3-3 three, three for 5 isn't absolutely embarrassing, would be the way I'd put it. You know, 3-3 okay. three, three for 5 in this format's kind of underwhelming against, like, Siege Mastodons or 3-3 three, three Flyers. So we see the same Nightwing Shade attack as last round. Let's see what happens. Um, yeah, 3-3 three, three for 5s are underwhelming, but making tokens makes it acceptable. Sure. There's still, like, if you're red, there's Seismic Stomp. If you're white, there's Fortify. There's a few things you can do with the tokens. You know, adding power to the board is always acceptable. Yeah, but you're getting free power. Yep. So this turn we opt to block with the Dead Lord Ghost. Which uh, I, I, I think I'm I'm okay with. The question is, uh, you know, we didn't block last turn. We're blocking yeah, it's about the same mana off. I guess like mana off. your question is what changed? Yeah, if, yeah. If you're not blocking last turn, what changed to make you want to block this turn? Which is a legitimate question. Yeah. So looks like we have a ah, uh, not Mark of the Vampire, another vampire, Blood Bear. Okay. Why is, it, why is that one also a vampire? They're just why not? Yeah, blood everyone, baron, everyone vampire, loves vampires. blood baron, vampire. Yeah. So uh, we got our sack outlet. Uh, not the the first one of these that's not just a functional Mantuko husk uh, Thorexian ghoul reprint. Yeah. Only other creatures can be sacrificed to it. Cannot sacrifice itself. No. So yeah, this is one of the cards that enables CBM's post board act treason plan. A plan I have a feeling we're gonna see a lot of this weekend. Like not people, not people just sideboarding into it, but I feel like this is what, it might be one of the sealed deck strategies in yeah. sealed is building an active treason deck because there are so many sacrifice outlets in black and active treason is at common in red. Right. You see, Chase and Goldstein kind of talking things through, figuring out what they want to do to try to be able to win this game again. Strum's team, Strum, Goldstein, and Chase are up a match. Strum dispatched Caster very, very quickly in two games. And they have Danny Goldstein up a game against Pro Tour champion Charles Gindy. Van Meter is up game one over Jonathan Chase, the one that we're watching right now, but they want to try to get out, get, get this thing over with if they can. So Corpse Hauler is going to step in front of the 6-6 six, six and just run the old turn into a raised dead fault and chump block. Sure. It's acceptable. Yeah, get, back yeah. the, get back the, uh, the shade. The shade. Yeah. I, you know, looking at this green-white deck, I'm kind of feeling the same kind of so we're talking about white being a little weaker in the last round. I'm not really sure, like, there's not a lot of endgame punch in a lot of these cards, you know. Not a lot of, like, the blue, black, and red cards can, you know, finish games, but a lot of these green and white cards are just kind of hanging out. Yeah, normally, I mean, normally you're used to, because there's a giant spider there from Chase, normally you're used to overrun Yeah. in a green, or some way to close out a game that if you do get in a board stall, either A, your creatures are better than theirs, or B, you, you have something to draw to in but, the form of overrun yeah. or the various overrun variants, and those don't exist here. CBM draws another ring flesh. Okay. Yeah, they just they don't exist here, and uh, no, I think that if you're green, you have to lean heavily on like something like rampaging bailoff in this, or not rampaging, uh, predatory bailoff in this format. Okay. Uh, you need to you need to push your size advantage, and that's the exact point where your size advantage takes place. I think that um, I remember looking at Huey's deck list from last round, and he had three giant spiders in his sideboard, just not even looking at them. And I think that. Um, that's, that's, telling. A, that's a very legitimate point about this format to make is that, you know, pillar field oxes, and, and a, you know, they're fine, they'll serve a role, but in a format where it's it's a matter of you need to defeat your opponent's quality cards at every point, having cards that are effectively dead against those is uh, not, not where you want to be necessarily. So something like uh, Giant Spider doesn't really help you beat a Sarah Angel in any way, shape, or form. So. What's it doing here? You know, Spore Mountain doesn't really beat a Sarah Angel in any form. It just gets sort of blooded up on the ground. You, you don't really want to be stuck with these cards. Dead Ruthless is fine. Like, I'm yeah, okay. Dead Ruthless is always good. Yeah, yeah. So Van Meter tapping five mana. The six, the six on the die representing how large the Nightmare is for you guys at home as well as us here in the booth. Here is the Nightwing Shade yet again. Again, Van Meter's hand is just two copies of Ring Flesh. I might have attacked there into the spider, uh, and just thrown the. Uh, oh, that's a, that's a sliver that we drew there. Yep. The sliver. Oh, Goldstein. So the match is over. This is just the uh, the honor match. Uh, Nate Thurm, Danny Goldstein, and John Chase defeat CVM, Charles Gindy, and Kenny Caster, and this is the uh, the battle for honor. And so it does look like that Goldstein did defeat Charles Gindy two games zero. Goldstein had a very very good deck. So. That is uh, not terribly surprising. 
And Strom did win his match over Kenny Caster very, very quickly. So Jonathan Chase versus Chris Manor. We'll stay, we'll stay here with this one. But this game and match is of little consequence, unfortunately. But it's always good, of course, to get practice in. Yeah, Make sure absolutely. you know how your deck operates. Learn how to we, play around some of the other tricks in the format. As you see Gindy there, I, a little disappointed in his loss. Yeah. At Providence, we actually won later matches because we played a third game out. You know, like one of my teammates missed a trigger and got reminded about it. And he's never missed a trigger for the rest of it. He's like, would never, like, would have lost some match, missed a trigger later. Yeah. We played the irrelevant game, lost because of missed trigger. Yeah. Now I know. Just things like that. Um, so there's a there's a sentinel sliver making this uh, megalithic sliver vigilance. Looks like he's getting ring flesh down in combat. So the briar pack alpha is going to step in, try and save it, and the other ring, flesh, ring flesh. So you know negative one, negative one plus six, so that's eight. You know six plus two, eight. Sliver down. Yeah, sliver, sliver should bite the dust. Because yep. again, the sliver will move up to eight toughness, and as you said, minus two from the two ring flushes. Six, Nightmare happens to be a six. That's what the yep. die is there for. And so, bye bye Sliver. I, I think that trade actually is fine for John, interestingly enough, because it means that there's one less ring flesh to stop this deadly boost from doing damage. And that was uh that was what I thought CBM might have been wanting to do with ring flushes. Again, I I'm maybe playing CBM side a little aggressive, trying to push downhill a little hard. But uh, I thought the ring flushes could have taken out the deadly recluses earlier and let him start cracking in. Yeah, I mean, I, basically, I think the way that CVM is trying to set up this game now, now that he's used both his ring flushes, and I think prior to that, actually, was that he wanted to use ring flushes as a way to kind of trade with, like, a real creature, like the Megantic Sliver. Sure. And then, you know, he's basically going to use this Nightwing Shade as the removal spell for the deadly recluse, because at some point, Chase is going to have to block. You know, yeah. because now you see Van Meter tapping all his mana, four activations, going to turn the Shade into a six-power creature, going to put Chase down to eight, and the next turn, we could see CVM attack with both the Nightmare and the Shade and saying, all right, Recluse, this is a lethal attack. you got to block something. Yeah. And then push through the, on the final turn. So I think that's how he's kind of using his threats this game. Yeah. Okay. Not to say that one is right or wrong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. He definitely has a plan. And, it, it, you know, uh, the important... The, oftentimes people talk about making the absolute best play, but when it's, like, a, such a higher-level architecture of a plan, it's, uh, it's really more important that you choose your plan and you make the right choices along your plan no, maybe your plan's the second best plan, but it's much worse to do half and half on like two different plans. I think. And I agree. CVN's been, he's been very consistent in what he's trying to accomplish this game. Yeah, he's committed. He has committed to a plan the entire time. Yeah, and I, you know, I've I've disagreed with this plan from the start, and like I've been explaining what I would do, but you know, his plays have been very consistent. Yeah. You see, CVN, he does have the, the card that he drew last turn was a mind rot. No good at this point in the game, of course. Both players basically playing off the top that, of their deck. That's the active treason, I think. I think that is, yeah, I think that is the active treason. So, yeah, he's tapping this looks three like the, the lethal attack. He's going to take a deadly wreck loose. Looks like this is Chase's only flying defense right now, so Chase over comes the spider. Chase hellbent. We had the mind rod even if he wasn't. Now we get the shove, and uh, that should be lethal. Shove with a deadly recluse just for just for chance. To get that extra point of damage in. Yeah, we we all we even have the blood baron to sack it if that mattered, yeah. but just just to be cute. So oh, there's a giant, giant spider off camera jumps in the way. Um, Active treason still awesome because again, blood baron takes down that uh, the deadly recluse. That yeah. is his removal spell. I mean, that's the important part here. I think yeah. actually is that you know he just wants to recluse off the board. You're going to see two activations of the nightwing shade I'm going to make it so that five damage is going to come across here, going to put chase down to three. And Nightmare's going to eat that giant spider. Then you see Van Meter going to sacrifice the Deadly Directors to the Blood Baron. So we're looking at two lethal flying attackers. Yes. CVM at 14. John Chase draws the Ranger's Gal one turn too late. Yeah, no kidding. One turn too late is definitely accurate. And it, again, this is kind of the point that, you know, we brought up a little bit earlier, is that normally in these situations like this, you know, Van Meter would have to sweat a little bit, hoping, I hope he doesn't draw, like, Overrun or Predatory Rampage or some sort of effect to get a lot of damage through. I think but the best thing that Chase could draw like this turn is, like, Enlarge. Enlarge. Uh, he has 12 power in play, if I counted correctly. And that would be 19. Enlarge would be lethal, I believe. So it's 19 minus 2. Yeah, it would be exact. Enlarge would be lethal. But... That was, that was what he had to sweat. And, it's, not like uh, drawing, it's not like drawing an overrun. No, it's, it's not the same. It's not, you know, enlarge is always seven. You always know it's seven. Yeah. Overrun, sometimes it's like 18, sometimes it's 
Yeah. Just so, enough. Sometimes it's plus three, sometimes it's plus 30. Yeah. It really does it, vary. It scales. Yeah, yeah so, I guess it does. Actually, it's not lethal. I forgot uh, you could Blood Baron to sacrifice creatures. So, uh -huh. CBM even had the lock and enlarge. And he, uh, yeah, because two life off the child, uh, one toughness, three, four, five is the Baron. So, you have to sacrifice one creature and you'd be left with a nightmare. So, even enlarge was not enough. It was exactly not enough, but it wasn't enough. <laughs> <laughs> So see some blocks here from Van Meter, some creatures are going to bite the dust, and you're going to see him extend the hand here, because CBM is going to win this game Still via the Flyers. Mind, right? Yeah, but he's not going to win the match. So the winner of the match, again, is Nate Strong, Danny Goldstein, and John Chase, defeating Kenny Castor, Charles Gindy, and Chris Van Meter, two matches to one. So uh, one of the main teams here in Castor, Gindy, and Van Meter is going to take their first loss, move yeah. on to 1-1 one -one right now. And uh, I don't remember...